final speaker for this first afternoon session. Um, again, Ravi Robitai, and uh, co-author who is not here, Stephen Brothers. Let me quickly say something about the co-author. Um, he's in Australia, and uh, he's both a mathematician and an astronomer. You, Pierre, on the family, on the other hand, are a professor in radiology at the Ohio State University in Columbus, which does not mean that you're a medical doctor by training, but you actually uh, started out as a chemist and then started working in biophysics and physics, um, especially with like high, ultra high field um, MRI uh, magnetic resonance. And you just told me like, you doubled the world record uh, in field strength to eight Teslas in MRI. Um, and uh, previously, you also were the director of MRI at Ohio State uh, at age 28, but now uh, are content with uh, being a professor at that institution. He has also edited an important book on ultra high field MRI in 2006. Uh, with a preface by Nobel Prize winner Paul Waterford. The title of the talk is A History of Kirchhoff's Law of Thermal Emission. And once the slides are ready, we're looking forward to listening to your talk. Well, uh, I was invited by a friend to come to Munich. He lives in Munich, Alexander Hunziker, and this is uh, the reason that I didn't come to give a talk all the way from Columbus to your society, and uh, maybe it's fitting because, of course, uh, Kirchhoff's Law is, uh, was first proposed in Germany. And uh, we'll just talk about just three of the fathers of, of thermal emission. Uh, first is Walter Stewart, who was uh, actually Scottish, in Hamburg, and then Kirchhoff in Klein. And uh, one year before Kirchhoff formulated his law, as most of you must know here in this room. Uh, the law of equivalence was pr proposed by Walford Stewart, and he said that the absorption of a plate equals its radiation, and that for every description of heat. And he also uh, said the same thing about a particle. Uh, but in addition to the law of equivalence, he had something that kind of approached Kirchhoff's law, and uh, basically he said that if you uh, have a cavity which is not a very good absorber, but it's kind of a polished metal that uh, can eventually become black if you drive the cavity. And uh, this is the quotation here. Now, he didn't make it a law, actually. He just, he just uh, described it. I think it's actually a footnote in the paper. And, uh, but never made it a law of physics that cavities become black. Of course, uh, so this is the idea that if, uh, on the left here you see uh, in a perfect uh, absorber, uh, you get unit radiation inside the absorber, let's say. And But if you have a polished surface on the inside, well, Stuart argued that you could drive this radiation in uh, many small steps, and as you put heat into this cavity, eventually you can make it black. But if you take a polished metal and you put heat into such a cavity, you'll just change its temperature. It's not going to start emitting more photons. So this was a conceptual problem. Because you do want to have you do want to have uh, temperature remain uh, unchanged. Uh, now we move to Kirchhoff, and uh, Kirchhoff uh, imagined, uh, of course, that black bodies uh, will be he, in his uh, paper, uh, in his classic paper. He said this investigation will be much simplified if we can imagine the enclosure to be composed wholly or in part of bodies which for infinitesimally small thickness completely absorb all rays which fall upon them. So it's interesting that in Kirchhoff, for Kirchhoff, uh, you'll see that the absorption is the central thing. And of course, this is true in black body radiation. It's absorption that gives us the, the ability to absorb is what gives us the emission. And you'll see that when Klein treated this in his proof, uh, he used materials that were non-absorbing. And this is one of the problems with Klein's proof of Kirchhoff's law. So this is just a statement of his law, which, which all of us know as we learn more in physics, that uh, if you have a space that's uh, surrounded by uh, perfectly opaque walls and you're in thermal equilibrium with those walls, 
that Kirchhoff said that the radiation inside such a space must always be black or normal. And uh, he, in his paper, formulated his law this way, that the emissive power of, uh, of the cavity divided by its absorptive power will be equal to some function. And uh, immediately, uh, as soon as he writes this, he sets the absorptive power to one. So he converts the absorptive power to uh, absorptivity. And uh, so uh, there we, of course, then we get the, the term E, which, which is brought to us by Max Planck. And uh, there's been various presentations of Kirchhoff's law over the years. In, in Kirchhoff's second paper, it's E over A, with little e. And Planck actually, uh, in his paper, it's, it's somewhat confusing. He, he used uh, the emission coefficient, and he used the absorption coefficient. Uh, but, but for the emission coefficient, he's, he's really talking about emissive power, so it's, it makes it a little bit uh, strange. And uh, then the modern notation uh, is on the right. So the thing about Kirchhoff's paper is, of course, this is a, something that we, that we hold as a, as a law in physics today. Uh, and, uh, but he derived this law from, it was a theoretical paper. There's no experimental proof in Kirchhoff's law that what he's saying is true. He just said all, all cavities must be black, and then he provides uh, in, in two subsequent years, uh, one short, shortly after one another, two proofs, but there is no experimental proof of this law. And interestingly, in Max Planck's book, uh, he has a very unusual approach to it because uh, he, he mostly uses perfect reflectors for his cavities. And uh, he, he, he knows that in a perfect reflector, uh, well, if you have E over A and you make A zero, that's undefined, and Planck realizes that if, if, if you look at the beginning of heat radiation in his book, The Theory of Heat Radiation, he realizes that zero over zero is undefined, and so he has a problem there. So in order to prevent that, he always places in his book, and this is throughout his text, uh, a small particle of carbon inside his cavities uh, to make sure that they are indeed black. And he calls these particles a catalyst, and I've disputed that. They're not catalysts, they're perfect absorbers. So. When you put a perfect absorber inside a cavity, it's the same as if you line the entire cavity with, uh, with a perfect absorber, because it is perfect. So, but he, this is what he said. He said, it is therefore possible to change a perfectly arbitrary radiation which exists at the start in, in the evacuated cavity, which is perfectly reflecting, with perfectly reflecting walls under cons consideration, into black radiation by the introduction of a minute particle of carbon. And I, I actually, I read the, 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 the theory of heat radiation many, many times. And uh, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more appreciation for it. But uh, it was, I finally decided, I was so fed up with this carbon particle, I decided to just write a paper on, on Max Planck and the carbon particle and how often it comes up in this book. And it's a, it's a major uh, problem for him. Uh, he, he desperately needs it, and Kirchhoff was right, of course he wouldn't. Uh, and, and if you look at the experimental world, uh, there's classic papers by DeVos where DeVos uh, uh, wrote these papers on evaluating the quality of a black body. And his idea was you could just take a block, and we do this in, in, in modern physics, I mean, you just take a block and drill it, and then uh, you know, look at it in the infrared, and the cavity appears black. And, but of course, if, if you do this, uh, and you'll see later in the talk, if you do this with a low emissivity cavity, uh, you're going to have problems. So what DeVos said is that uh, by changing the dimension of the cavities, we can make them appear more black. But that's a, actually a violation of what Kirchhoff wanted. His, his dimension only had to do with uh, eliminating the possibility of diffraction. He didn't say that now we're going to make, let's say, a cavity infinitely large so that the radiation can get lost within it. So this demonstrates that Kirchhoff's law was never valid as the dimension must only be determined by diffraction considerations, not by emissivity. And uh, I had a discussion with a fellow of the Royal Society of Engineering, and he wrote that the reason that we do not, he, he wrote to me in an email, the reason that we do not make cavities from low emissivity materials is that they would be too large. <laughs> 
And that, of course, is telling you that there's a fundamental problem here. Uh, it's, it has nothing to do with the size of the cavity, okay? So uh, Arnie is not here, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the slides were made well before I knew he would be here, so it doesn't make any difference. But he did write a beautiful paper, which I've cited multiple times, on the proofs of Kirchhoff's uh, radiation law before and after applying. And uh, it, it contains a discussion of the so-called proofs of Kirchhoff's law advanced by Kirchhoff, Klein, Helmholtz, Cunningham, and Hilbert. And he talks about the approaches and shortfalls of these derivations. I can't cover all of them, but I did want to cover at least the proof advanced by Kirchhoff himself. And this was the first one, uh, which was a, advanced actually at a meeting in Berlin in 1859. And so what, what Kirchhoff does uh, is he uses two plates. Now just ignore for now the little r prime and the big r prime. Kirchhoff never considered those. He just considered a plate, uh, plate C, and he put a mirror behind it, which of course would cover transmissivity. And he never really considered the reflectivity of the, of the face of the plate. And, and then he said that if I put an arbitrary plate in front of it, uh, then I can prove uh, this law by putting a mirror behind that second plate. And uh, the problem, uh, if you read on his book, uh, uh, his paper, uh, it required a body that emitted and absorbed only at one wavelength. And uh, this, such bodies do not exist, and uh, it was justified by nothing. But there's uh, easier problems, there's another, other problems which you could read in this paper. Uh, which I wrote on uh, on a return to Stuart's law, and uh, the problem is that Planck, uh, Kirchhoff ignored reflection by the plates themselves, and uh, you can destroy his proof very easily just by making the second plate, plate C, little C, just make it a perfect reflector, and this proof falls apart. So now, when you look at proofs of Kirchhoff's law, you'll see that the problem, whenever you find fails failings in the proof. It's always by an improper treatment of reflection, and this was also the case with Planck's proof. Uh, now, Kirchhoff obviously knew, he must have realized that I don't like this proof at all, so just a few months later, he actually comes up with a second proof, and uh, this proof uh, required, uh, and this is just a, one of the diagrams that you can find in this paper, it required bodies, uh, this is from Arnie's paper again, it required bodies showing colors of thin plates without emitting or absorbing any radiation itself, which was a hypothesis uh, petsuit. And uh, but there's another problem again in reflection. So Kirchhoff says I can make the walls of this from any material, and uh, he used an object which was arbitrary in it. Uh, you could start with a black body and then uh, uh, an object that's perfectly emitting and. Then and then put just an arbitrary object, but you can you can make the exterior walls here anything you want. And uh, if I make them perfectly perfectly reflecting, uh, the radiation within that will, will not be black. And uh, especially if I make the object also perfectly reflecting, it has no means of emitting a photon. So so the ca the cavity would contain nothing. And if I change uh, the step, which Kirchhoff does, is he changes the object at opening three. And if I change that object and make it perfectly absorbing, then the cavity falls out of thermal equilibrium, out of equilibrium, and the proof is shot. So thermal equilibrium is destroyed when the walls are perfectly reflecting, and the object at three is at first perfectly reflecting and perfectly <coughs> absorbing. So just to show, just to have you think about Kirchhoff's law well a little bit, I just want to review. I was. Uh, my granddaughter had just been born. I was driving to Chicago, and I was thinking so much about Kirchhoff's law. And I was going to the hospital. It was a snowstorm. And <laughs> I came up with this little idea in my head of uh, we're going to build two boxes. And we're going to put on the outside box, we're going to make a perfect absorber. And on the inside box, we're going to put it as a perfect reflector. And we're going to just soak these two boxes. We're going to place them in a healing bath. And we'll open the wall so the, the outside box will be sealed. And in the inside box, we'll just pretend that the wall can be open. So now we're going to get four Kelvin, and so the entire content of the big box will be four Kelvin radiation. And then what I do is I just close the inside box. I just close that wall, 
and then uh, I just get rid of the helium. And the little box on the, on the inside is, is just in thermal contact. It's, it's sitting on the floor of the big box. So what happens is that the, the, the big box, uh, I get rid of the helium, and everything moves up to room temperature. But what is the radiation inside the little box? Well, the radiation is, of course, still going to be 4 Kelvin radiation. But the box will be at 300 Kelvin because the energy entered the walls of the box. So we're still in thermal equilibrium. And when you read Kirchhoff's paper, you'll see that what he required was temperature equilibrium. And this, uh, this experiment meets it. So it, it clearly shows that the little box cannot contain uh, black radiation. Now, for those who are familiar with this topic, this is one that uh, is often advanced. That uh, if you have if you have two cavities, and uh, this is the second law argument, uh, people try to say, well, if you have a perfectly black cavity on the left and then an empty cavity on the right, and you put them together, uh, if the cavity on the right is really empty, then uh, you'll you'll get uh, photons that will move from cavity one to cavity two, and they can do work, and that's a that's a violation, that's a second law violation because they're supposed to be at the same temperature. And the problem with this uh, analysis is that you ignore that simultaneously in thermal equilibrium, it's net heat transfer that matters. So you can transfer a photon, but at the same time, I can use conduction to bring the heat back on the other side, and so there's no work done. So this is not a proof of Kirchhoff's law. So thermal equilibrium requires that there is no heat transfer simply it doesn't, does not require that there's not heat transfer. Simply, sorry. So thermal equilibrium requires that there is no net transfer of heat, not simply that there is no net conduction. And so heat transfer by radiative processes can be balanced by conduction. And otherwise, if uh, you don't agree with this, you end up violating the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, because the cavity, the cavity two, what defines its temperature is the energy contained in its walls. And so the problem with Planck's analysis is that, it, so if you look at black body radiation, they take all the radi all the energy of the system is put in the radiation field. And in ob obviously in real objects, uh, the, radi the, the energy of the object is not all in this radiation field. We have conduction bands and, and some of the energy is contained within those. So when you, when you actually put these two cavities together, what you end up is with is gray radiation, uh, obviously. Uh, how did I ever get into this mess? And uh, well, I got into it because I, I'm uh, an MRI person, and a long time ago I built this uh, this cavity, and it was sealed. I sealed it, uh, and, I, and I, if you connect it to a to a scanner, of course, I can pulse into this cavity. And what do I want when I do MRI? And, and, and this, is, this gives you an idea of why it's so important that we correct Kirchhoff's law. Of course, we have tons of MRI scanners in the world, and we do care about them. And uh, they demand that the cavity be resonant if it's not black. And of course, our, our lasers are the same way. Uh, we demand that they are resonant. So Kirchhoff could have never known this in 1859, that, that a sealed cavity, which is perfectly reflecting, uh, will not be black, and thank God it's not. So when Paul sent to this cavity, it was an amazing thing. And, you know, for AT, if the, if the cavity is open, it takes about 100 watts of power to mutate the spins here, uh, on it, which is a big ball of mineral oil placed inside. But when you seal this cavity, it took less than a watt. It was just unbelievably fun. So uh, it tells you something about perfect reflectors and, uh, and, uh, and sealed cavities. So here's the other thing. If Kirchhoff was right, of course, laboratory black bodies are always made from good absorbers of radiation, right? They're never made from poor emitters. And graphite and soot continue to play an important role in their construction. So if you look at uh, some NIST papers, uh, you'll see that they are still building walls of many of these cavities with graphite. And uh, this is the central thing. When we learn about black body radiation in modern physics, I don't know if they still teach modern physics. I'm so old now, I'm, I'm assuming that we, it hasn't been changed to another course. I'm talking about all these young faces in there. But uh, uh, we never talk about work. And, but but that's, that's what happens in a black body. A black body is actually doing work. 
and a perfect reflector cannot do any work. That's the central point. And that's why uh, we spend so much money building perfect reflectors. We don't want them to do work. So uh, if you take a, a real black body, its interior will be lined with highly absorbent materials. And you can read these reviews. And this uh, lecture will go up online soon for you. So you don't have to take notes if you don't want to. Uh, so here's a, here's a little simple experiment to show us what we're dealing with. And, and also what Kirchhoff encountered, because you know you have to give him that he was in 1860, so he didn't have an understanding that we'd have perfect reflectors or very nearly perfect reflectors. And uh, so here's an example. What I did was I, I just took a little block of graphite and I followed the Bose's procedure and just drilled some holes in this. It might have been a, an inch or so deep. And uh, there were different materials, steel, brass, copper, and aluminum, and graphite. And lo and behold, uh, if you look at them at uh, room temperature, wow, and Kirchhoff is obviously right because they're all filled with the same radiation. And that's what we teach our students. And, and of course, we do these experiments, and wow, it works. So, but unfortunately, that's not the whole story. So, what we'll do now is we'll actually do a little experiment. And I can do this experiment very quickly if I wanted to. And so, we can maintain thermal equilibrium. But We'll just bring a disturbance of, of, of uh, heat uh, near this near the system. And so what happens is that the three cavities, you have some three cavities there at the bottom left that all immediately get filled with radiation from the rod, which is at much higher temperature than the, than the block. But you'll see a little speck there by the, by the hole of the graphite uh, block. And that hole is doing work, right? It maintains the appearance it had without the rod there. So any incident radiation that comes in from that rod is instantly converted to the radiation which corresponds to the wall temperature of the graphite block. And the same is true with the steel, which is just underneath the rod. So graphite converts incoming radiation in immediately to radiation corresponding to the nature of its walls. When challenged, the holes which are constructed from nearly perfect reflectors are unable to convert the incident radiation to the radiation which would have corresponded to the temperature of their walls. It's not a thermal equilibrium question, as it is the as their temperature remains essentially unaffected by the rod. It's a question of ability to do work. And here's another example. If you take a bunch of these little blocks, and uh, so the bottom ones, these are to different depths. Uh, shallower on the right side and as you move across so there so the, the bottom row is let's say copper then we have the graphite block then we have I think aluminum and then brass and the holes on the right are, are just the, the tip the tip of the uh, the tip of the drill bit and then as you go towards the left you get deeper and deeper and what do you see in the graphite you immediately see the temperature of the block even the hole on the right is white but you'll see that in the others, you're only manifesting what is uh, the temperature uh, of the of the block of the so so the graphite is is manifesting uh, the temperature of the, of the block, which has now been raised by the heat plate. But the other ones are only manifesting what's the temperature of the room, and uh, that's because it's the room that's filling them with radiation. They're unable to make their own radiation. But as I go deeper to deeper holes then uh, you get more of the radiation from the plate that is entering those holes and can make them appear to be white. And you'll also see that there's crescents on the second uh, row there where you have a mixture of room temperature and uh, what is coming from the heat plate. So note that the three holes on the right are not filled with radiation at the correct temperature. Uh, they remain affected by radiation in the room. And there is a clear presence of crescents in some of the Cavities, only graphite was able to do the work, perfectly reflecting cavities, displayed incident radiation. And now we'll just go quickly uh, through Planck's proof of Kirchhoff's law, which is faulty. And uh, this is important to physics, and uh, why do we care? And the reason we care is that Planck's uh, equation is the only equation in physics that has never been linked to the physical world. He gives us uh, an expression for the distribution of photons, but he doesn't tell us what is the transition species. Uh, for instance, if you think of a line and line, 
what is the setting and for alignment? It's the hydrogen atom. Uh, the transition species is the electron, and we have energy uh, transition between energy levels. But for Planck, we don't have that, and that's because Planck said, uh, and Kirchhoff said, this was independent of the nature of the walls, which is clearly false. So uh, I, I wrote this paper. This is a complete analysis of what Planck's treatment of Kirchhoff's law is and the errors that it contains. Uh, so in the first uh, edition of the theory of heat radiation, this is what Planck writes. He deviated frequently from the customary methods of treatments wherever the matter presented itself or consideration of the forms of presentation seemed to call for, especially when he derived Kirchhoff's law. And in deriving Kirchhoff's law, Planck considers that the radiation which he believed existed in an object, in reality, uh, heat transfer within objects takes place using convection, conduction. Phonons and conduction bands exist, or in a liquid or a gas, you have convection. Uh, this observation is sufficient to discount Planck's proof. However, for the sake of revisiting this time period and in order to expose that Kirchhoff's law has no theoretical foundation, we will assume that, as Planck does, that objects can radiate internally. So, uh, he, he begins by looking at the specific intensity of radiation at a frequency v, polarized in an arbitrary plane k of v in the first instance, and k prime of v in the second substance. And the problem is, of course, heat radiation is never polarized. But he uses polarized radiation for his proof. And he writes, for, and he even recognizes himself, he writes for a plane wave, even though that it could be periodical, with the wave lying within the optical or thermal region, can never be interpreted as heat radiation. So he knew that polarized light is never heat radiation, but he depends on it for his proof. And then he moves on, and this is the real injury here. He, in order to make his proof, uh, he, he decides not to treat black bodies as Kirchhoff did, as able to absorb over an infinitely thin region, but rather he now, uh, it, he first says that he's not gonna assume uh, that it can absorb in an infinitely thin region, and he moves well beyond that. He actually now, he doesn't want any absorption at all, and he now redefines a black body as a rough surface having the property of completely transmitting the incident radiation, and is now describing it as black. So this, I, I hate to say it, it's unfortunate, but this is complete nonsense, because a black body uh, can never be looked at as perfectly tra as transmitting the radiation and not absorbing it. And then he, he writes, strictly speaking, the surface of a body never emits rays, but rather allows part of the rays coming in to the interior to pass through. This is key to his proof. He doesn't want absorption at the surface. The other part is reflected inward, and according as a function transmitted is larger or smaller, the surface seems to emit more or less intense radiation. So he's now moving for his proof to transmission. And, of course, the proper expression, if you have an inbound ray, uh, Planck will use two media in order to do this. Uh, and uh, he puts them adjacent to one another, and he looks at an element at the bounding surface. And he writes that that radiation can be, con can be completely treated uh, by, by considering only reflectivity and transmissivity. He doesn't consider the absorption of that element. And that's a flaw. So uh, you can look at this on the left. Uh, you have uh, the incident radiation, uh, the specific intensity, K sub V. And Planck looks at it as hitting a little element that's at the boundary. Part of it is reflected, and part of it is transmitted through. And he does this uh, with uh, K sub V prime coming from the other uh, uh, medium, and then he writes a balance for these two. And notice now that no reflection, no absorption terms uh, exist in this expression. But the real injurious part is his use of Brewster's law. So what he does is, am I already done? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So uh, what he does is he actually uses polarized radiation, and then uh, comes to the conclusion that there be no reflection. Of course, we know this in Brewster's Law. If you hit uh, radiation uh, at, at a proper angle, you will have no reflection. 
uh, of one of the polarized components. So, so Planck comes to the conclusion that the reflectivity of his two media are the same. And of course, these reflectivities, rho and rho prime, are the reflectivities of two different materials. And we know that they're never the same. But Planck actually makes them equal because by using Brewster's law, he's able to set them both to zero. And it, actually, he never checked reflection because he's using Brewster's law on polarized light. So he never checked the true reflective properties of those materials. And if you want to destroy per Planck's proof, once again, all you have to do is make medium two a perfect reflector, and the proof falls apart. And uh, this is, uh, he ends up uh, on the right here, uh, ends up uh, proving Kirchhoff's law uh, by making uh, rho and rho prime equal to zero. But actually, uh, this is the proper expression from which he would have never arrived at Kirchhoff's law. So, in conclusion, a valid proof of Kirchhoff's law does not exist, whether it's theoretical <coughs> or experimental. And as a result, and this is the key thing here for physics, Planck length, Planck mass, time, and temperature have no more fundamental significance than the mile versus the kilometer. Whereas Planck himself, and this depends on Kirchhoff's law being valid, if Kirchhoff's law is valid and all cavities contain black radiation, then of course uh, these functions, these, uh, uh, these quantities do become universal. But if Kirchhoff's law falls apart, then they no longer are. Now, I go back. Uh, because of Kirchhoff's law, Planck's equation remains unlinked to the physical world. And so we don't know what the physical setting is, we don't know the energy levels, and we don't know the transition species. And actually, Planck wrote himself that to try to understand this was a hopeless undertaking, and precisely because of Kirchhoff's law. And Einstein, I think, spent uh, many years of his life, I think it was five years of his life, coming, uh, trying to understand these three things, and uh, never did come uh, to a resolution. And so, surely the situation can be corrected if true black body emission is viewed as a consequence of vibrating atomic nuclei within the confines of a lattice so if you want a black body spectrum, uh, you must have a lattice to produce it. You don't get it from magic. And uh, this is, requires a paradigm shift in physics, uh, such that uh, physics can be pointed in the right direction for the future generations of scientists. And if you're interested, uh, a lot of these little things you can see on uh, my YouTube channel, Sky Scholar, which is listed there. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, as I understood, though, a gas could not be uh, a black body. So no, what, what, con what, conse what consequences process. would that? Pardon? What consequences would that entail? For well, okay, so if you follow a little bit of my work, I mean, of course, Kirchhoff's law is, is the basis of gaseous stars, right? We, we, we believe that a star can produce a thermal spectrum because of Kirchhoff's law being valid. If it's not valid, then a star cannot produce a thermal spectrum, and a star must be condensed matter, which is what I've argued, that the sun must be made of metallic hydrogen. It must have a lattice. So this has uh, consequences beyond just history, but I think people need to start thinking about it. All right? Thank you for your